There we go. Are you going to make some announcements before we begin? Uh, no, let's just okay. go. Okay. I'll do that. Okay. So are we good to go? Yes, you can announce the next talk, I guess, if you want. Okay, to good now. All okay. right. Well, everybody, hello. This is your favorite speaker, Ron, <laughs> giving you a wonderful tour of the world. As we are all in lockdown and can't really go very far, um, this talk today on Mexico City will have to make up for um, the inability to travel. So, uh, for those of you who know me, I don't have to say anything, but those of you who don't know me, it's Ronald Brown and I teach at Toro College and I live in the middle of Queens and we are just going through a renewed lockdown, shutting down schools and the big debate, as I'm sure you're aware of, if they're gonna close down non-essential activities. My campus, Toro College campus, uh, closed down yesterday. And so I don't get free photocopies anymore. I have to um, do them at home. So we are once again going to do a wonderful tour of Mexico City. So just an announcement before we begin, um, uh, Nadine uh, has been scheduling ones into the future. Um, uh, and so today is Mexico City. I know there was some confusion about whether it was going to be Tel Aviv, but Tel Aviv is going to be in, on November 10. And between the two, we have October 20th, which is going to be Berlin. So that's October 20th, Berlin. November 10th is Tel Aviv. And uh, then we move into December. And December 15 is going to be Cairo, the Queen of the Nile. So we have a rather busy schedule of world travel while we're all under lockdown. So I hope you will enjoy it. So. Once again, definitely check the calendar for the Hewlett Woodmere Library so that uh, there won't be any confusion or anything. Uh, Nadine keeps it very updated so we all know uh, what's going on. Okay, well, without further ado, let us begin. Okay, our topic for today is in the series that I've been doing for quite some time on the sacred cities of the world. Now, of course, as I always say, I don't talk about a city if I haven't been there, if I haven't even lived there. So when I say lived, I mean serious, like five years in Jerusalem, six years in Geneva, a year in Moscow, a year in Budapest, a uh, summer in um, uh, Dakar, in, um, um, in Africa. So, I mean, Cairo is another place where I've been, Tel Aviv as well. So, today is going to be one of those cities where I have been at least 30 or 40 times. I got to Mexico City the very first time because back in those good old days before the pandemic and before September 11, I worked as a courier. And that meant I would get a call at midnight saying, Ron, can you fly to Mexico City tomorrow morning at six o'clock? And I would say, yes, let me put some clothes on, take a shower. They said the car's already downstairs. You can take a shower in Mexico. And I would be delivering anything from a human heart for transplant to bank documents to be uh, signed and returned. So I was going back and forth to Mexico sometimes um, twice a month, racking up frequent flyer miles. And many times they would just let me stay there for a week because it would be courier going there, but nothing to bring back. So they say, how long do you want to stay? They give me sometimes even a, um, a coupon for a hotel or for a restaurant. So I got to know Mexico City very, very well. But like most cities, uh, um, uh, Mexico City has its own unique characteristic. And like so many cities, 
It began as a sacred city, the sacred city of the Aztecs. So once again, here is the uh, outline, the Aztec promised land. Uh, Teotihuacan, the lost civilization. They're the ones who built those giant pyramids on the outskirts of Mexico City. The arrival of the Spanish, the emergence of the cult of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and then the Mexico City, which I know and visit all the time. So, now before we jump into Mexico City, it is important to realize that there are certain universal building blocks of all religions which constantly recur. For example, you see in the upper left, you see Moses up on the mountain getting his 12 commandments. I bet a lot of you didn't know that CNN was there at the top of the mountain when God gave Moses the 10 commandments. So it is documented. And here we see an actual picture of Moses on the mountain. Well, mountains are sacred in every religion. The Hindu gods live in mounts and mountains, Mount Olympus of the Greek gods. Jesus was crucified on the Mount of Golgotha. Beside that, we see a river, water. Well, whether it's a mikvah or Catholic baptism or washing your hands uh, before Muslim prayer, Water is sacred. Think of the holy water when you go into church and you make the sign of the cross. Another universal building block is food, whether it's kosher, vegetarian, halal, whether it's fasting during Lent. These are all food regulations. I mean, everything from Christmas cookies to Easter chocolate to the Passover plate. Food is a universal building block of all religions. In the middle at the bottom, clothing. I mean, look at some of the get-ups that the Pope gets on. I mean, Federico Fellini did a wonderful film on Rome, which you call Fellini Roma, and he has a liturgical fashion show of priests and nuns and monks. I mean, whether it is the beard of an Orthodox Jew, the veil of a Muslim woman. Clothing is a universal building block. And at the left, we see the Book of Mormon. Every religion has a body of teaching, whether it's in a scroll, as in a Torah scroll, or whether it is the Book of Mormon, the Jewish Bible, the Quran, the Gita. Books are universal religion, of universal uh, elements of every religion. Other ones include music. Think of the chanting in a Buddhist temple or the uh, uh, rabbi praying in Hebrew. Um, hair, something we never think of, but whether it is the Orthodox Jews with the side curls, among the Sikh religion of India, it is illegal for a man to cut his hair. So he wraps it around his head, puts a cloth on it to preserve his hair because according to the Sikh religion, a man must never cut his hair. Growing beards, very important for Judaism and um, uh, Hinduism. Architecture at the bottom. I mean, you know St. Patrick's Cathedral is very different from a Hindu temple or a Buddhist temple or any other house of worship. And of course, candles, light. Why do we celebrate Sunday, the day of light, the festival of light? Think of Christmas tree lights, candles in a synagogue, fire, for the Zoroastrians burning a body in Hinduism. Once again, fire putting an end to life. Well, today we are talking about sacred cities. Well, we see Jerusalem. How did Jerusalem become sacred? Well, it was sacred long before the Jews were even invented. It was the sacred city of the Jebusites. Read the Jewish Bible. What did King David do when he conquered Jerusalem? He killed all the adults and he enslaved all the children and turned it from a Jebusite city, sacred city, to a Jewish sacred city. 
Then it became a Christian sacred city with Jesus, and we see the Dome of the Rock, it is a Muslim sacred city. I think the only people who haven't claimed Jerusalem as their sacred city are the Buddhists, but I'm sure they're working on it. Below that, we see a place where I spent a wonderful vacation in the middle of Senegal, the sacred city of Touba. is a sacred city where alcohol, pornography, shorts, smoking is forbidden, the sacred city of Sheikh Ahmadou Bamba. On the right, we see the sacred city of the Mormons, Salt Lake City. And below that, of course, Rome, the eternal city, constantly reinventing itself. So today we are going to discover another sacred city, and that is Mexico City. Well, when did Mexico City begin? Well, of course, it began in ancient legends. The Aztecs, which most people don't realize, are good, blue-blooded Americans. They inhabited the southern, southwest part of the United States. And for thousands of years, they were a nomadic people. But they had a legend that someday the Aztec god would lead them to a sacred promised land. And there, God would bless their fortune and make them into a great people. Sort of sounds like Abraham in the Jewish Bible, making a compact or a covenant with God. Well, these types of covenants with founding fathers are as old as the hills. And the Aztec legend is very similar to the Jewish legend. Atzlan is the legendary homeland of the Mexicans. They don't know for sure whether it was Texas or Arizona or New Mexico or California. The Aztec people, the Aztec name is a Nahuatl word, which is the Mexican uh, language of the Aztecs. Uh, Aztec means the people from Atzlan. And so they were fated to roam the southwest part of the United States, down into Mexico, waiting for their number one God to appear to them and to show them their sacred land, their promised land, and their sacred city. Now, I'm not very good at pronunciation. Maybe my Mexican friends in Mexico, if they're long gone, can tell me how that is pronounced. But it is Huitzilopochtli, who was, as you can see, that rather fearsome looking picture on the left, which is the National Museum of Mexico, was the god of war, the god of the sun, and the god of human sacrifice. He was like God the Father. He was Jehovah. He was Allah. He was the number one god in the ancient Aztec pantheon. And here we see another drawing of him, rather fierce looking, holding up a weapon of war and shield and bedecked in feathers. Well, he was worshipped by the ancient Aztecs since time immemorial, and he was the one who had promised them a promised land and a holy city. Sometime around the year 1323, their God revealed to them that the sign of their new city and their new homeland would be when in their world travels they stumble upon an eagle perched on a cactus with a serpent, a rattlesnake in its mouth. And when they see that, that was a sign from God that this is their sacred homeland. And so on the left, we see a, um, a drawing made by the Aztecs with at the center, at the center of the X is the symbol. 
And that is the symbol which appears today on the Mexican flag, on Mexican currency, on posters, even tattooed on the backs and the uh, chests of Mexicans, because that is their sign from God that Mexico City is not just another city. It's no Chicago or San Francisco or even a New York, but it is a land promised by their God. So they wandered from 1323 to 1376 through the plains and the mountains of Southwest Pennsylvania, uh, United States in the Northern Mexico until they stumbled upon a lake in the middle of Mexico they rode out into the middle of the lake and they found an island. And there they found the ruins of an even more ancient civilization. Uninhabited, had existed for thousands of years. Nobody knew who built them, but the Aztecs were convinced that the gods built them and prepared them for the arrival of the Aztecs. And these are the pyramids on the outskirts of Mexico City today. It is believed uh, Teotihuacan was built approximately 100 BC or BCE. Until today, people don't know really who built them. But of course, the Aztecs were convinced they were built by the gods themselves, a nomadic people roaming the arid southwest of the United States and northern Mexico could never have managed the resources to build such a magnificent avenue lined with stone temples, the, the pyramid of the sun, the pyramid of the moon, and the stone carvings, which they only had other stones and weak metal to carve. So this was a discovery of monumental proportions for the Aztecs. And so they knew that this was the land that God had prepared for them. It was their homeland. Well, a series of great kings ruled over the Aztecs, expanded the empire beyond the reaches of the Mexico City Valley, conquering the entire central part of Mexico, even down into the ancient Maya lands of the Yucatan. I won't even try to pronounce the names of these kings, but we do know them because the Aztecs were literate. They had their um, writing system. They preserved the histories of the kings when they were born. Now, on, at the bottom, we see Montezuma I, who ruled, and Montezuma II. We say Montezuma in English, but it's really Moctezuma. And various places in central Mex Mexico City, they put up memorials to um, uh, Itzcoatl, uh, who ruled from 1427 to 1440. They put them on the walls and to decorate the city to show that these were the ancient kings of the Aztecs who ruled over a world empire. Now, Moctezuma II took the throne in 1502, but unfortunately, the Spanish arrived and he was murdered in 1520 and the Spanish conquered the Aztec Empire, as it did the Maya Empire in the Yucatan, and the whole way down to the Incas in Peru. Well, the temple itself, when you go to Mexico, is still there. The, the, many of the temples are still standing. You see that they were built on an island in the middle of a great lake. Some people call it a swamp. And they had their religious rituals, which they carried on. And uh, this was the great capital of the civilization. 
Now the ancient Aztecs were highly skilled, not only in philosophy and religion and government and warfare and especially architecture, but very good stone carvers. Now it is believed, as the picture on the bottom on the left, that a large part of the ancient city of the Aztecs, Mexico City, was actually a lake, an artificial lake. Of course, today it is dry uh, and you walk around it, but uh, it was a um, rather a monumental place. The Aztecs, like their Mayas in uh, southern Mexico, were very skilled stone carvers. The picture on the right, you see a, uh, stone carvings, the faces, faces of dragons and other monsters. Uh, the picture at the top on the left is highly ornate, very typical of the Maya uh, architectural carvings in the southern part of uh, uh, Mexico, which eventually the Aztecs conquered and absorbed into their growing empire. And here we see, uh, in the middle, we see Stenestitlan and Teotihuacan and the lake and the growth of the empire going from the Atlantic Ocean across the mountains down to the Pacific and down into the yellow part at the bottom, the ancient Maya Empire. And they conquered all kinds of different people whose names we know, for example, the Mayas, uh, the Zapotecs, and the uh, uh, different type of uh, um, people who were gradually absorbed into this growing empire. Now, I've traveled all over in Mexico. There on the left, you see me at the Pyramid of the Sun during one of my very early trips when I could still work as a courier. And on the right, that's a more recent trip. Uh, you can see the hair has changed and uh, physically changed a bit, but that was down in Palenque, which is a great Maya city in the Yucatan Peninsula itself. Well, this great, sprawling, rich, sophisticated empire was destroyed by the Spanish. There we see Hernan Cortez, who uh, was, came over with the Spanish and conquered the entire Central America following the arrival of Christopher Columbus. From 1519 to 1521, the Spanish conquered the empire. Well, of course, when you have a giant city, sophisticated, beautiful architecture, very skilled, literate people, even the Spanish realized that this was an ancient civilization to be built upon. On. And here when we deal with sacred cities, once again, uh, like Rome, the eternal city, constantly being reinvented, or Jerusalem, the sacred cities of the Jebusites, then of the Jews, then of the Christians, then of the Muslims, and now back to the Jews, and who knows what's going to be in the future. Once a sacred city has come into existence, it constantly grows and changes. And so, of course, Mexico City, the sacred city of an ancient civilization that nobody knows about, and then later, the sacred city of the Aztecs became a sacred city of the Mexicans. And on the right, we see the Cathedral of Mexico City, giant monstrosity of a building built on the swamps. In fact, it was actually sinking into the swamp because if you look at the picture on the left, you can see it is built on islands, but they are really swampy uh, areas and stone buildings tend to constantly sink into the swamp. And so well, a couple of years ago, they had UNESCO helped and other countries helped to pump underneath the cathedral and rise it so that it would be level and rise it up so that it wouldn't keep sinking. 
from what I hear, they pump tons and tons of cement underneath it. So it is now riding on a giant pillow of cement to keep it from sinking. One of the largest churches in the world constantly being um, expanded. Now, if you look at the picture on the left, you see the giant causeway leading into the city with the giant temple in the middle of Mexico City. Well, the Spanish demolished the temple, the pagan temple, and built the Catholic church from the very same stone on the very same spot. And surrounding the cathedral, there are architectural uh, digs, archeological digs, where they reveal temples and giant stone carvings from the time of the Aztecs. Now, once again, this is a very typical thing with sacred cities. When you conquer a sacred city, you demolish the sacred places that was there, and you build on top of them and reclaim them as sacred. So you had the temple of the Japhetites, then you had the temple of Solomon, then you had the mosque built by the um, Muslims, you had the church of the Holy Sepulcher, and so one holy place built upon another to stake your claim to what is by then a sacred place. Now, one of the major goddesses of the Aztecs was Tonatzin. She was the eternal mother goddess. Now, on the right, on the bottom, you see the famous Willendorf statue of a fertility goddess. Now, when you just look at that woman, I mean, she would produce enough milk to uh, nourish a kindergarten. And those hips, she could have had triplets um, one after the other with very little discomfort. This was the perfect woman. My father um, always said that he preferred rather, um, rather hefty women. That's a nice word for it. He didn't like the twiggy girls of today, which are all skin and bones. And he had an expression. He always said, I want a woman who you don't have to shake the sheets to find her. Now, this might not be very politically correct, but this is the ideal of the mother goddess, which goes back to ancient Greece, goes back to the ancient Philistines, Babylonians, uh, um, even in the Jewish Bible, they talk about people constantly being tempted to worship the fertility goddess. And so, very central to the Aztec religion was the eternal goddess, the mother goddess, uh, Tonantzin. And here we see a stone carving. Stone carving is interesting. It's volcanic basalt, one of the hardest stones to carve. But the statue, once it is carved, will last forever. Well, when the Spanish conquered Mexico City, they demolished the temple, they built the Catholic cathedral on its spot, or in 1531, they were already building it. Well, the Catholics who began, of course, in ancient Palestine, in Jerusalem, and then spread to Rome and then up into Moscow and to Spain. Whenever the Catholics would conquer a new people or convert a new people, on one hand, they stamped out their pagan religion, but on the other hand, they would absorb elements of that religion into theirs. That's what we call the Roman Catholic Church, because the Roman Catholic religion is half Jesus in Palestine and half Roman religion. And so the two religions merged, creating a whole new religion. So when the Spanish got to Mexico and conquered the place, they didn't destroy everything. They absorbed a lot of it as well. And they sort of a syncretic religion blending the two. Well, 
One day in December in 1531, there was a Mexican Aztec peasant named Juan Diego. We don't know his real name because he had, of course, like everybody else, had assumed a Spanish name. Well, he was wandering in the ruins of the ancient temple where the fertility goddess of the Aztecs, Tonantzin, was worshipped. And just by custom, since that's where the Aztecs had gone to pray for a good marriage, pray for childbirth, pray for the health of their children and their wives, and he must have been up there praying. And suddenly, on the side of the hill, this woman who we see on the right appeared to him. Well, I can imagine his shock. He looked up, and she was a white woman, not Mexican. She spoke to him in Spanish. And he looked up, and he says, I'm sorry, lady. I don't really know who the hell you are, but... Um, I shouldn't be speaking to a Spanish woman, and I don't speak Spanish, which he said in Nahuatl. Well, immediately, the woman looked at him and started speaking to him in his native Nahuatl. And her skin turned as dark as his. And she said, I am the mother of the Spanish God. I am the mother of this Jesus who they are all talking about. And I want you to go to the Bishop of Mexico City and say, I want a church to be built on this spot to mark the transition from Aztec religion to Catholicism by way of a woman. Well, of course, Juan Diego said, good Lord, who am I, uh, an illiterate Mex uh, Aztec peasant, going and talking to the big, powerful Spanish bishop of Mexico City, surrounded by soldiers. Well, he went, he talked to the bishop, and uh, I, probably he couldn't even get into the palace or wherever he was living, went back, and he says, lady, I'm sorry, but the bishop won't even talk to me. Uh, but he did tell me that if this apparition was authentic, you should have the power to give me Castilian roses, like on the left, which were typically Spanish and probably didn't even grow in Mexico. And in December, you are to bring me a big bouquet of roses. Well, Juan Diego says, good Lord, this is really pushing it, but... The lady said, all right, go to the bishop and I'll take care of everything. Now, I'm paraphrasing this, this episode a bit, but he went back to the bishop and the bishop said, did you get my roses? Really treating him with disdain, a dark-skinned Mexican Aztec speaking to a high-bred aristocratic Spanish bishop. Well, he opened his cloak and out fell hundreds of Castilian roses, which didn't even grow in Mexico. And on his cloak was the seal, the picture which we see here, of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so it shows the merging of the ancient beliefs of the Aztecs and the new beliefs of the Spanish Catholics. Well, the bishop, um, Juan de Zumaraga, day means that he was a Spanish aristocrat, agreed finally to build a church which is constantly expanding. The old church uh, shows it up on the hill where the uh, Tonatzin's temple was, and then down the hill they built the two churches in later centuries, and the one in the middle is the brand new church which is there today. Once again, this is Our Lady of Guadalupe, showing the transition from Aztec paganism to Catholicism, or the merging of the two. The inside of the new church is filled with a magnificent organ, and you see against the wall, see the picture on the right, the actual cloak 
of Juan Diego, which is venerated as a great relic. Now, the Mexicans until today claim that they are not a country established by the Spanish. They are a mixture of ancient Aztec culture and beliefs and traditions with the Spanish. And the Mexicans are very proud that they are what we call a mestizo, or in Spanish we see the monument there, a monumento al mestizaje, meaning mestiz mixing of Spanish and Mexican Aztec. And Cortes himself ended up marrying an Aztec princess, showing the blending of the two civilizations into one. So even though the Mexicans tend to be super Catholic, still they are proud of their Aztec heritage. Well, Our Lady of Guadalupe was adopted as the national symbol, the unique identity of the Mexicans, not just Spanish, but Spanish and Aztec. And here we see um, one of the great revolutionaries of Mexico back in the early 1800s demanding independence from Spain. You see him standing there. He was a priest who became a general, who became a revolutionary. And on the wall behind him is a painting of Our Lady of Guadalupe, meaning we are not Spanish, we are not European, we are a mixture of ancient Aztecs and Spanish. Until today, you can't go anywhere in Mexico without seeing guys with Our Lady of Guadalupe tattooed on their backs, paintings on the wall. Every church has an altar to the national patron of Mexico, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the blending of Aztec and Spanish cultures and religion. Everywhere you see paintings, shrines at home, paintings on the wall, decorative things made with mosaics and stones, homes with tiles painted on the wall of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And Our Lady of Guadalupe is the patroness of Mexico, the protectress of Mexico. When the United States invaded Mexico in the 1840s and we stole California and Texas and everything in between, the Mexican soldiers carried their um, banners with Our Lady of Guadalupe. When the French invaded in 1861 and put in a French emperor, they resisted in the name of their patron, Our Lady of Guadalupe. They, even when Mexico had its revolution in 1910 and became a secular state, separated church and state, even persecuted the Catholics they remained loyal to their Virgin of Guadalupe. The Cristeros, 1926 to 1929, demanded preserving the Catholic character of Mexico. And here we see a banner, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King, with Our Lady of Guadalupe, and just below it, the ancient Aztec symbol of the eagle on the cactus with the rattlesnake in its mouth. So it's Viva Cristo Rey y Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. Long live Christ the King and Our Lady of Guadalupe. Inseparable two which make up the Mexican identity. Now, this happens not just in Mexico. I mean, in Portugal, we have our famous Our Lady of Fatima, which was another apparition of Mary to the people of Portugal 
as Portugal was being drugged into the modern world of secularism, revolution, and democracy, and everything else, Mary appeared to the people of Portugal at Fatima and said, I will protect you. In Poland, we have Our Lady of Czestochowa, where I spent a wonderful vacation years ago. Once again, when Poland was being partitioned by the Russians, by the Germans, by the Austrians, invaded by all of its neighbors, Mary appeared at the shrine of Czestochowa and said, I will be your patroness. I will protect you. I will preserve Polish identity against the Russians, the Germans, the Austrians, the communists, and even today, American secularism. Our Lady of Lourdes in France, another Marian apparition. When France was going through a period of revolutions and secularism and persecution of the church and closing of Catholic schools and hospitals, once again, Mary appeared at Lourdes and said, I will protect you. And this is a very typical Catholic thing. We have Our Lady of Good Success in Quito, Ecuador on the left. Our Lady of Medjugorje in Bosnia in communist-ruled Yugoslavia. Other Marian apparitions protecting the country. Japan, we have Our Lady of Akita rallying the Japanese to Catholicism. In Africa and Rwanda, Our Lady of Kibohe, once again, the apparition to preserve the country against the forces which were out to destroy it. Even in Bayside, Queens, Flushing, Queens, not far from where I live, when the United States was legalizing abortion, legalizing gay marriage, New York was the pornographic capital of the country, Prayer in schools was being eliminated. Well, Mary appeared to Veronica Lucan in the 70s and said, I will protect you. And Veronica, who I got to know rather well a number of years ago until she died, was a fervent believer that Mary would protect the Catholics of New York from their evil governments. And so it is the same with Our Lady of Guadalupe. And these pictures here are in New York City. On the right is the Church of Our Lady of Guadalupe, a sacred shrine for Mexicans. Up in uh, Harlem in Mexican neighborhoods like uh, Jackson Heights and other places, it's not at all uncommon to see giant paintings the size of a building of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And at the bottom in the middle is the shrine to Our Lady of Guadalupe in St. Patrick's Cathedral, once again showing that she is the symbol of Mexican Catholicism. And Mexicans until today, when they have a parade in honor of Our Lady of Guadalupe in December, processions and masses. You see a lot of Mexicans going on their knees up the streets of New York and other cities where Mexicans have settled, carrying the Mexican flag, giant statues of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Men tattoo themselves on their arms, on their backs, on their chests, they wear medals with Our Lady of Guadalupe, T-shirts and sweatshirts, which are sold everywhere in Mexico as a sign of their Mexican pride. Now, Mexico is one of the most exciting cities to visit. Architecture, music, the food is everywhere. And the Mexicans take great pride in the city. Now, of course, it's constantly being ravaged by earthquakes. 
And today it is one of the most uh, severely hit with the pandemic, but still it makes a major effort to preserve it. This building is just uh, not far from the hotel where I usually stay. And you can see the corner with the very ornate stone carvings going back and inspired very much by the Aztec love of stone carvings. Now the picture on the right, it shows the lighter carved stone at the bottom and the darker above. So many people passing, touching it, storms and probably all kinds of other things have damaged some of these beautiful uh, architectural elements. But the Mexicans will spend a fortune in restoring such a wonderful um, corner carved stone piece, something you wonder how long it would last in New York. We would never have the money and the time to put into such an elegant um, piece of stone carving that Mexicans from the time of the Aztecs and their ornately carved temples, this is a tradition which continues. Seems everywhere you go, you see beautiful buildings. The one on the top left, you see a statue of a saint way up in the top, elegant surroundings of the windows. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Mexico City, it was built on a swamp and it doesn't have good stone for buildings. So when you build a cathedral, like I said, it sinks. Well, this church is uh, on the bottom two pictures is right near uh, where I stay in downtown Mexico. And you can see how far the church has sunk. You can see that you have to go downstairs to go in the front door. And a picture on the right, they just made a little bridge from the sidewalk into the church. Then you go down into the church. So the church is constantly sinking. Now that's a lot of stone and that is heavy. And above that, you see a typical street scene with old uh, uh, buildings, many going back to the colonial era, which are being preserved. Now, since the city is built on a swamp, everything is sinking, everything is heaving. Now, there you see me in the top left navigating one of the constant broken sidewalks, which they're constantly repairing. Uh, on a picture on the right, you see a drain which is open. Well, one, one of my many trips, uh, I just wasn't careful where I was going. So the picture on the right at the bottom shows the result of my accident. Uh, they're both copies of my right leg where they um, uh, messed it up. So they had to go in, put it straight, put through two screws right through my leg. And there you see me at Toro going around on my crutches. So if you do go to Mexico, always look where you are going because you might not um, survive to talk about it. One of my favorite places in Mexico is Lagunilla Marketplace. It is a flea market the size of a small city. Everything and anything from Aztec uh, stone carvings up to Art Deco lamps, postcards, books, furniture, you name it, it is there. Nearby is the giant a vegetable market claimed to be the largest market in the world. Mexican cuisine is very, very famous. Um, spicy food, if, if you like it. I mean, the marketplaces, you can just walk for days and never exhaust some of these markets. One of the major holidays of Mexico City is um, Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. We call it Halloween or All Souls and All Saints Day. This is another sign of the blending of Catholicism with the ancient Aztec religion. The Aztecs were, as you probably well known, 
uh, very given to human sacrifice. Uh, that's how they got the, uh, or guaranteed the um, good graces of the various gods. Well, death was central to the Aztec religion. Well, then the Spanish arrived and they brought all these various viruses and diseases with them, which many people argue wiped out half of the population of the Aztecs. Well, in honor of death, recognizing the centrality of death in Mexican history, whether it is the Aztecs or the plagues that the Spanish brought, the Day of the Dead, or All Souls and All Saints holidays before Easter, um, became the major Catholic holiday. In sense of cultures and traditions, it even outshone uh, Easter and Christmas as major holidays. People dress up as dead people. They dress up as skeletons. The picture on the top on the right, that's at the lobby in my hotel, where they made a skeleton surrounded by flowers on a bicycle, and the whole hotel lobby was filled with skeletons, and people like the ones on the right, the mariachi dancers, but the dead. And the picture on the left at the bottom shows a cemetery scene because they believe that the dead return on the night. And that if you go to the cemetery and you don't have great grandfather's favorite beer, or you don't have great great grandmother's favorite chocolate, or you didn't bring a new hat or your nephew who died of AIDS two weeks earlier, their spirits would haunt you for the year. So you play your mariachi and Mexican music, you dance, you eat, you enjoy it. Now, of course, great grandfather's bottle of whiskey is there. Well, of course, his spirit can only drink the spiritual part of the whiskey. So once your great grandfather has drunk the bottle of full of the spirit of the whiskey, what's left is for everybody else to enjoy. And your great aunt Martha, who just couldn't eat enough roast chicken, well, um, um, she ate the part that she wanted um, spiritually, and then the rest of the chicken was enjoyed by everybody. And so this is really one of the major holidays. Um, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, two of the greatest painters of Mexico, constantly returned to this theme. Now this theme of the Day of the Dead and commemorating the dead is especially important now because as I am speaking, this is October 2020, we are in the middle of a pandemic, and Mexico is being especially hard hit. But once again, it has the religious instruments for dealing with mass deaths. And it doesn't make it easier. You are very sad when your father passes away, but they have the spiritual equipment for dealing with it. They know he will be back at the next day of the dead. He will see the new baby who was born. He will bless the wedding between his granddaughter and his grandson. So we see that death, once again, links the Aztecs with the Spanish Catholics, and that it remains especially vibrant today in the age of pandemic. Now, another magnificent thing you should not miss is, of course, the Museum of Anthropology, one of probably the top 10 museums in the world. I mean, ultra-modern uh, buildings surrounded by gardens uh, and uh, um, stone carvings from every period of Aztec history. 
The pic picture on the bottom left is the interlocking calendars of the Aztecs, measuring the solar, the lunar, the religious, the political calendars, all interlinked in a extremely complex stone carvings. The stones on the right show the various deities, the stone carvings with maps and everything uh, portraying the history of the Aztec and Maya and other civilizations of ancient Mexico. And finally, modern Mexico is as vibrant as everything else. At the picture on the top left, that is Bellas Artes, that is the uh, Symphony Hall, the Opera House. Once again, a pile of stone, not far from the central Socolo Square, but once again, sinking into the ground. When it was built in the early 1900s, you had to go up a flight of stairs to go in. Now you go up two steps, and it is probably going to be the case in another 20 or 30 years where you'll have to go down a flight of stairs to go into the building because it is built on swamp. The picture at the top right is the university. Once again, the, the, the thrill of art and design, but typically Aztec, Spanish Catholic, but brought into the modern uh, era. Below it is the uh, Paseo de la Reforma, the big monumental highway carved into the city, lined with banks and insurance companies. The, financial center of the city. And on the left is another building showing the love of ultra-modern architecture. Mexico is not lost in the past. It is not um, isolated in the past, but it is very much a city that um, is still uh, vibrant, lively, constantly growing and changing city. So with that, I would like to thank you all for joining me on this whirlwind trip of Mexico. And who knows, maybe the next time I'm down there, uh, once this pandemic business is open, uh, who knows, I might run into you um, on the street. Now, if you have any questions,